you Jump, 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 jump What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party This is what we done started Peace and love, party people. It's the BKMC, the MCO, Talib Kweli. And we are on the run, but we still getting it done. We are live from Las Vegas on the New York State of Mind tour in the MGM coked up psych. And I said that because you know what it is. This is official Wu-Tang, official episode. And speaking of Wu-Tang, arguably one of the greatest groups, hip-hop groups of all time, if not greatest musical groups of all time, this man that we talking to is an integral part of the Wu-Tang Clan and an integral part of the hip-hop landscape. You first heard him on one of the best albums of all time, 36 Chambers. The song was Chess Box, and we gonna get into that. Yeah. You then heard him later on classic like Black Shampoo, you know what I'm saying, Gravel Pit. Um, he came with solo albums after that, Golden Arms, Redemption, Kino Speaker, further showcasing his versatility and his depth. He's been an unsung hero operating behind the scenes often in the back rooms of history, influencing and inspiring some of your favorite artists. Like myself, this man is a published author. I encourage you to go get his book, Raw, My Journey into the Wu-Tang. Um, it is unfiltered. It is raw. It details not just his story, but the story of the Wu-Tang Clan, um, their rise, their struggles. The Guardian called it eye popping. Charlemagne the God said he couldn't put it down. Raekwon, the chef, another People's Party guest, said it was mesmerizing. This man is a survivor, a storyteller, a lyrical samurai. He's been slicing beats since the early 90s. His voice is distinct and powerful. It's been instrumental in shaping the Wu-Tang Clan sound. Ladies and gentlemen, the People's Party is proud to have Golden Arms, the universal God with the olive oil voice. You God from the Wu-Tang. What's up, man? Peace, man. How you feel? I'm back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for taking out your time to do this. As we know... You know we've been trying to do this for a minute. For a long time. Yes. Time is valuable. Time is precious. The last Black Star album was called No Fear of Time. So I don't have a fear of time, but I do understand that time is valuable. And we are here on, on tour, right? Yes, sir. So the tour takes precedence. The sound check and being there for the crew and you got to hit your marks. That's right. You know what I'm saying? So I appreciate you even taking the time to sit with us here. Our last time you and me really chopped it up was Dubai. Yes. Oh, I forgot. You, me, you, and Most Def. Yeah. And, uh, Clark Kent. Clark Kent was out there. But it was me, you, and Most Def, really. We were just yeah. on a little, we was on a little huddle. We had a little, yeah. little power. Yeah, we had a little power. We was up there for like, what, four hours? Just for sitting a there. minute. Yeah, we were sitting there talking in the middle of the night. It was a beautiful night in Dubai. It was beautiful. Yeah, it was. I appreciate that. Yes, One of my uh, greatest hip-hop memories yeah, being man. in Dubai with Wu-Tang yeah. and yourself. Now, I don't know if you know this, but I was once on VH1 Hip Hop Honors and they honored the Wu-Tang and um, I performed your verse from Chess Boxing. I heard about that. Yeah. yeah. And I, I performed it because I felt like I had all the verses that they were trying to, everybody was picking the verses they want. That verse on that song is so deep. You didn't have a lot of time on that song. There's a lot of people. Yeah. But you really utilize your time and space on that song very well. Yeah. Could you walk us through coming up with that verse? Well, I wrote that verse when I was 16. Mm. And um, like, all, like all, a, lot of, a lot of verses that we had on the 36 Chambers and all that stuff, that stuff was written when we was kids and um, we just had to get the right music to go with it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was a regular typical, typical school kid. Mm -hmm. He was doing good in school. I was, you know, going to school and hustling at the same time. And it just, I just incorporated the things I felt that, um, you know, that the universe might might want to hear. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And Raw Rizzo loved that fucking verse. He used to love that verse. Yeah, I had a couple of verses that he was like, yo, can I get this verse? Can I get that verse? Right. You know what I'm saying? Because, um, you know, we used to go to his crib and um, do our recordings and, 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 you know, and little small little projects at the time. And um, we used to record on the balcony. I don't know if you've ever been to Stapleton Projects where Ghost mm -hmm. in them was from. It was like a big-ass penitentiary. Nah, but I seen a... Cameron go there in the middle of the night one day on YouTube yeah. and ask around for Ghostface. <laughs> is Stapleton also the, the one where they had the the, um, the, um, the Purge movie? They did the origin story of The Purge. You probably think so. Probably I'm, so. I'm not sure if it was Stapleton or Park Hill, but I think it was Stapleton. Yeah, I think it was Stapleton. And they talked about how they first tried The Purge in the projects first. Probably so. Which I thought was ill, an ill way to bring probably that story. Probably so. Stapleton, Stapleton was a crazy project because, mm -hmm. like I said, it always reminded me of a big ass penitentiary. Mm -hmm. And my my brother's father, his his family, the bestest was down there. Cause down, you know, in Staten Island, you got families that are big. You got the mm -hmm. Dales, you got the Best, you had certain families that was huge. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And um, you know, I used to be down there, and uh, and I, that's how I met up with RZA. 
I mean, years ago. Probably, I knew his brother before I knew him, though. You know, Divine? The, yeah, I knew Devon. Mm. Knew Devon, and uh, it was like the sixth grade, fifth or sixth grade. Mm. But he was only there for like a week. Right. right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, right. you know, but I still, as time moved on, we bumped into each other and, you know, and I got close with RZA and I'm saying he liked the things I like. Then I, when I found out he was making beats, mm -hmm. me and Melvin, we couldn't, you know, that was our, our like zone to get out of the streets, man. We were, right. When we wanted to get the fuck away from the drama, the guns, the, the, the drugs and all that shit. Like I said, we go to the, the power, you know, we go to RZA house. Yeah. And just get away from it, man. That story's been documented through your music and through different document documentaries and the TV show, of course. Yes, yes. Where the, in the TV show, you got arrested in the studio. I don't know if that really happened no, I never in real got, life. I, never I got feel arrested like in the when I saw that, and by the way, I love the TV show. I, I, I'm a huge fan of it, being a fan of Wu-Tang. But when I saw that scene, I'm like, that didn't go down like that. No, 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 that didn't go down like <laughs> that. They just had to show that you got wasn't in the studio for some of the um, 36. Yeah. So I think that's the way they condensed it. Yeah, I got, I got jammed up, man, because uh, I just let my anger get a, get the best of me and shit. And, um, you know, somebody, back in those days and shit, and I was hustling, and one of the nigga dudes, his name was Jesus, he sold me some whack shit. Mm -hmm. And um, I went uptown and tried to tear his head off. He called the cops on me, and he jammed me up. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so that was, that was that. So I had to sit down for like about, you know, I had to do my little one to three. I wind up doing the whole fucking goddamn three years, though. Mm. Paul, I can curse, I can do it. Absolutely. Okay. We, as a matter of fact, we encourage it. Okay. Yeah, um, so I had to do my little three years. and But I, I came home on work release to lay down my vocals. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Then I got violated again. You know what I mean, I kept getting violated because I was just, I just didn't learn. You know what I'm saying? I like the way in your book, when you tell that story, you also give out legal advice. Oh, yeah. Why are you telling the story? Yeah. Because it's very important for people who've been through that to give that out. A friend of mine, a good friend, Seth Bird, he's always like, yo, if somebody got the drop on you, got to give it up. And you said that in your book. That's right. I called him immediately. I was like, yo, you got said the same thing you said. Your verse and I'm taking back kind of details some of this stuff. Take it back. I can't see. You, you gotta understand something. We got over 200 verses, so I got I gotta be like, which which which, which, which one is that? I know because you know I've been on tour with Wu Tang and I've been interviewing. Take you know I interviewed this. Master Killer and I've been re researching. I've been going back and listening to those albums. Take it back. And it's on Eight Diagrams. Okay, okay. And it's um it's it's my favorite song off of Eight Diagrams. And it's the one I know Eight Diagrams was the album where RZA was starting to have more orchestral production and. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, we didn't like that. We, yeah, didn't like, we didn't like the orchestra stuff. Yeah, a lot we, of y'all spoke out against yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, because we wanted, we, wanted, we wanted our grimy beats back. We wanted our right. chop samples. But Take It Back is the record that, off that album, that feels like that. Feel like that. that, feel like that chamber? Yes. Okay, all right. Yes, so I feel like that was an underrated class. Did I spank that shit? Did I spank it? Yes, you did. All right. And all you right. talked about the jail <laughs> shit. You, you broke it down. Um, yes, you absolutely spanked it, yes. Okay. Now, you were born, you were in Brownsville before you got to you. Park Hill. Yeah, my family's from Brooklyn. A lot of my, right. my whole family was born and bred in Brooklyn. My mother, my all my cousins and my aunts is Brooklyn and Queens. Mm -hmm. I think everybody's buried in fucking uh over there. You know where everybody's buried at in Brooklyn. Was that the fucking um uh, Greens? Not, not the Greens. The one was between Brooklyn and Queens. That big ass cemetery. That's not Greenwood, right? Ah, I forgot the name of it. But anyway, it's the biggest cemetery in New York. And uh, yeah, so my family's from 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 Brownsville, Fort Greene, Canarsie, and uh, you got Astoria. Mm -hmm. um, and Raekwon's family is from... Yeah, he's from the same thing. Yeah, if he went 15... I think it's 1540... 1543... Um, what's the Howard House? It's 1543 East New York Avenue. 1546, right. one of them. Yeah, it's one of the names of them buildings. You grew oh. up in Brownsville, what you call the Mayor Koch punch you in your face, snatch your pocketbook era. Oh, my goodness. It was terrible. That's that very era. descriptive. Yes, it was. Yes, I used to go to Brooklyn. I'm from Flatbush. I used to go to hooky parties in Brownsville. <laughs> But only because I knew certain Brownsville niggas. That's I right. I just go. That's right. You know how it is back yeah. in those days. Certain certain, certain areas, you didn't know nobody, yeah. you, you couldn't go up in those spots. Yeah. You know, that's that's how rough it was back in those days. And dudes was constantly getting their shit took in and their sneakers took in and their gazelles took in. They, yeah, I got tested for my sneakers and my polo coat and all everything, that. All everything. That shit. All the time, man. That's yeah, how we man. grew up, man. You know what I mean? We and, and it wasn't no guns really in effect the way it is right now. So you either had to, you know, either you was a knuckle dude. Mm hmm. Oh, he was a oh he was a, oh he was a stabbing dude back right. in those days. You know what I'm saying? Right. If you had to, if you had to have one of them fucking skills, you had to be able to stab a nigga right. or knock a nigga out. Go to the hardware store real, real quick. Get a hammer or a razor, or whatever you can get something, your hands on. Something that you could cause dot violence to. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> then some way out of no fucking where, I, I tell the story. So I, I ain't really put this in the book, mm. but it felt like in the beginning 
when we was kids, we was doing good, man. Yeah. We was basketball playing. We was all going to school. Mm -hmm. and we kind of knew what we was going to do. I was like, I'm going, I'm going to go to vocational school. Then after that, I'm going to yeah, dreams. Yeah, no, but not no real illegal shit. Mm -hmm. Then they drop a shit ton of fucking goddamn drugs out of nowhere. This fucking death fucking cloud mm. came out of nowhere and just like poisoned the community. And next thing you know, I could walk outside my crib and go on my checks and make about 20 fucking racks. And by the hour, and I'm like, damn, how you, how you not get caught up in that temptation as a kid and being poor and impoverished? Being poor. Yes. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That temptation was too great, but of course, you know, it got the best of a lot of my brothers. And, it, and, it, and it, that era was like, wow. I think back about it right now, like, damn mm. it, man. That shit was a setup of some shit. It's a lot of trauma from that era. A lot of trauma, bro. We had Youssef Salam, who was famously from the Exonerated Five, used to be the Central Park Five. He was on the show. And he said, similar to what you said, he said, when I was a kid, you know, I had all these dreams. Nobody dreamed about a life of crime. Nobody dreamed about selling drugs. That wasn't our dreams. That wasn't our dreams, man. That yeah, wasn't man. our dreams, man. I want either if I wasn't good at basketball, okay, I'm going to school. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I told niggas all the time I wanted to be an embalmer. I was like, I was on my way to be an embalmer because I was good with science. Mm -hmm. That was my fucking, you know, that was one of my things that I love. And uh, you know, and next thing you know, I'm getting, I'm in the fucking god. I'm having hammers. I'm running around with guns and shit. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, getting the fucking scraps over buildings and I'm like, this shit is, this shit was crazy. I think about it right now, this day, man. Like, mm. I, I can't believe I survived that bullshit. Another thing from that era that I thought I would never come back to was the packs of wild dogs that used to you roam the hood. You remember that, don't you? Yo, I, when you said that in your book, I'm like, yo, I know exactly what you're talking about. Come Me and my homeboys used to go take the train to the city to go to parties. Yeah. And we get off at the junction, and we lived in a two fans zone. We have to walk to the crib yes. from the train station, and there would be a pack of dogs waiting on us. Yeah, like, bro. we had beef with them dogs. Yeah, you did, bro. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. So you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, back then, it was no ASPCA. Right. And that was even worse. Because we imagine. got fields and all this yeah, other shit. Yeah, y'all got all, this, all that lakes and all yeah, that. Yeah, we had all this fucking land. Mm -hmm. So when we ride on our bikes, we used to get, them motherfuckers used to run out of the fucking, out of the woods yep. and chase us on our bikes. Yep. I used to make motherfucker out. Yep. I you know, know what I'm exactly saying? what you're talking Then I told him all the time, I never forgot that one dog, though, this fucking, <laughs> that fucking Doberman Pitcher. I told him for this day. <laughs> Blood fucking shot red Doberman Pitcher forming from the mouth, nigga. We had rabies or something. That's crazy. And, and we used to be flying, hauling ass. His dog was in the streets. He probably was in the streets about two weeks before they came and got his ass. Mm. Yeah, it's crazy that we have relationships with these dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what, I'm, that's what I was good with, the slingshot, though. Right. We had to walk around. You know, you, built the, you bent the coat hanger up. You bent the coat hanger up, right? Get reinforced with two or three. You tape them up. Put your rubber bands on the shit. Double, double and reinforce the fucking shit. Put it in your pocket. Come on, you was riding your bike. You see what I'm saying? Jump on one up on top of the car, so bang, bang. <laughs> so your, your next album has to be called MacGyver because you just told me you just made a slingshot out of hanger, but in your book you talk about making bikes and all types of. No, wild that's shit. what we was. We was kids like that. Yeah, man. That's what I, I never made a bike though. I never put a oh, bike together. Y'all was awesome. No, Staten Island was crazy. <laughs> he said they find parts and just put the bike yeah, together. Yeah, we, we was doing all that shit, man. Ask Dick. Dick could tell you. Yeah, man. It was, it was Artie was blunt. Who used to do that shit? Pee wee. Them niggas, them niggas, Ernie, Ernie used to be nice with that shit, man. And he used to have, he had one big wheel in the back, one small right. wheel in the front. The shit didn't even match. Somehow. Man, I think my son do that, because my son be into them bikes. I you think know what I'm saying? Do that in the then he gets the washers and make the shit line up right in the back of the joint and hit. It didn't go that fast. It'd go right there, but it gets you where you got to That's go. Right. You That's know right. what I'm saying? Now, I don't think I could interview you, God, and talk about Brownsville okay. without talking about Mike Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta see Mike, man. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta have, I gotta have an interview with Mike. Yeah. I, did you see him talk about the situation? Yes, I did. Okay. Yes, I did. So for people who watching, you have told, and you st in your book you talked about how Mike Tyson robbed your mom's. No, I said my mother. See, people blew it out of course. Okay. She said, she said, the nigga who snatched my earrings. Mm -hmm. I swear to God, that was Mike Tyson. That right, me, right, right. Avenue, in front of OTB. You know what I'm saying? I know exactly which OTB and, you talking about. Exactly. Right on yeah. Pickin Avenue. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, if you're from Brownsville at those times, when I said the OTB, automatically it's going to trigger you like, oh, shit. Right. And Mike might be sitting there like, you know what? He, he ain't saying he did it. Right. But he, in the back of his mind, he like, damn, I might have. It's possible, right. It's definitely, yeah, that, we yeah. was over there. He was getting money. And my mother's like, yo, you ain't no hard feelings. You know, we still, you know, it was that's right. when we was coming up out of the streets. The poor people shit. Yeah, it was poor yeah. people shit. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So, you know, I told, him, I told Mike, my mother would love to make a fucking dinner for you and come over to the crib and, 
give a hug, kiss, you know. And, That's real talk. And call, he, he did offer to, to repay, but it, I think that, um, you know, I have a quote here from Mike Tyson that I think speaks to what to what you just said. Yeah. He said, he said, um, in that same interview, when he was, I think he was talking to Zab Judah. Yeah. He said um, about Brownsville, he said, I'm a product of fear. I'm a, I'm a scary guy because I grew up there. If I wasn't able to see what I saw in Brownsville, there's no way I'd be the person I am today. That's right. Yeah. That's what I understand. But I understand what he's saying. Yeah. You had to, you go around, you grew up around fear, either you become the victim of fear mm -hmm. or you create the fucking fear. Right. You know what I'm saying? He was the one, he said, fuck, that came to a point in his life, he stopped being a victim mm -hmm. and became the person who inflicted the fear. Right. You know what I'm saying? It happens to all, that's what happens to a lot of kids who become killers. Because mm -hmm. they get hit with so much victimization and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden they snap. And just like that, they become bloodthirsty fucking maniacs. Right. And, I, and I've seen this shit happen many a times. Like, you know what I mean? I grew up with a lot of, a lot of dudes in my, you know, I grew up with. These niggas is in jail for the rest of their life. You know what I mean? My right. whole, you know, you see a couple of, you know, dudes like, like Supreme mm -hmm. and Reef. Those are the last, last dinosaurs in my hood. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Supreme just came home from doing 25 years. Mm -hmm. Reef, he did about 22. He did 20 years too. So they, they all came home and been fortunate to be in a circle. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But the other ones who didn't make it, you know, them niggas is doing life. You know what I'm saying? Them niggas, they started off, we all started off together, playing in right. the park, being kids, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Stick ball, run catching kids, you know, tag, all that good shit. Yeah. Good kids we was. But then somewhere down the line, the shit just went left. You talking about that on a couple of songs, um, Better Tomorrow, your verse from Better Tomorrow is dealing with that. And your verse off the Venom album, the felon joint. Oh, yeah. That was, that was, I wrote that. That was um that was when I was upstate. Mm. I wrote that. I was because that's what I was um reminding myself, and I was thinking about all the times and all the stuff I went through when I was in the camp. You know what I mean? My first time when nigga pulled a razor out on me, how I handled the shit. I got chumped the first time. Nigga chumped me because I ain't, I ain't understand. You know, caught me off guard. Mm -hmm. Got the drop. Yeah, he got the drop mm -hmm. on me. So I'm like, oh, okay, sure, you got it. Right. Then, then once I talked to Big Blood and these niggas, like, yo, nigga, don't let that nigga do that. This is what you do. It's Scooby the Scoop, Scoop. <laughs> so, Scoop. Not the Scooby the Doo. <laughs> so, what you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Word? All right. right. And I know exactly what you mean. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. He just told me, like, as soon as he come out the shower, nigga, he got shower slippers on his bus's head. Mm. So I was like, okay, that's how you do it. And sure enough, he came out the shower with his slippers on, all wet and silky. Three piece him, I got the phone time back. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? He took the phone time for me because he pulled out the race. Yo, shorty, what you gonna do for that? Mm -hmm. I was like, oh shit, I'm a little nigga. I was only weighing 160 at the time. This nigga, mm -hmm. just, you know what I mean? Nigga came on me. Now, you know? Speaking of 160, yeah. Let's talk about the 160. Oh, it's 160. Ooh, the, ooh, <laughs> the ooh building. Jesus. Word up, Christ. Park Hill, PS49 days. Yes. You know what I'm saying? You was out there with Raekwon, Meth, Deck, Cap. You was beatboxing. All that. Oh, um, take us back to the before we get into like how ill Killer Hill became. Yes. The good times that you remember from growing up in that area. Well, the good times is that everybody's mother would welcome you in, except mm -hmm. Raekwon's mother. It okay. took a little time, a okay. little time. Ann wasn't having it. She was right. like, you know, if you know, so I got into you know Ray's house because she she knew my mother, mm -hmm. but she took a took a little time for me to get there too. But you know, Kappa's mother. Miss Linda, God bless her. Mm. She, she let us come upstairs. Dex's mom, she saved me numerous times. The police were chasing me. Her door was always open. Mm -hmm. So you can just go boom, 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 and come inside the house and you hear the walkie talkies outside. Shh. He's on the fifth floor. He's in the right. room. Shh. And you sit in the house like this. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, you know, we had those type of situations going on in our hood. I can go into any building and disappear like magic. Mm. Soon as I get in the building, if I get in the building, it's a wrap. You ain't finding me. Right. I'm not a projects kid, but the projects I know from being in New York City is like a city within a city. Yes. Yes, that's exactly the way you put it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, but the good times was that, you know, we used to go out partying together. And that's when we had the crews. We had our, you know, little gangs together before they mm -hmm. was so-called gangs. We didn't learn about no fucking gangs until they became popular on, mm -hmm. you know, on West Coast, whatever, whatever. But we had our gangs. It was Rec Posse, it was DMD, and BCC. You know what I'm saying? And um, well, BCC was the, the first crew we had. Was, we was babies. We was kids. We called it Baby, baby Crash Crew. Mm -hmm. And then we grew from Baby Crash Crew to DMD was Dick Him Down Posse. <laughs> you and then, Cap was in that. Yeah, right? no, it was me. It was all of us. It was me, Cap, uh, Seven. It was Dick all of down posse. We had, it, was, it was the whole, you know, it was the whole posse. Then it became Wreck. became mm -hmm. Wreck Posse. And that was, the, that was the one where we just, 
that's when we started getting violent. We that's because of the, re the rec room. Yeah, but we was getting real, we got real violent in them, them days. After that, when we was getting wrecked, we just, you come in here, you wasn't from the town, you was, you was in the wrong spot. You was mm -hmm. not trying, you was not trying to be, if you came from Brooklyn trying to act like you was posting up, mm -hmm. gurney. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. That was it. You come home from Queens, gurney. Everybody was just getting bust, you know, get shut down because this was our town. This was our shit. Gurney, I never heard that one. Yeah. It's a new one. You know this, you know this. I, I'll get it. I'll use context clues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So. Yeah. That's how it was, man. So the ownership model of Park Hill was both privately owned and federally subsidized. We didn't know this. I finally realized that later on. I wonder why I was just smoking hot. Break down why that makes it so hot. Well, federal subsidized means that everything you're doing there is under federal investigation. Mm -hmm. If you if you do anything fucking crazy, the feds have the right to come in and investigate you, see what the hell you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You have no privacy. You know how it is. It, it, long, if you're doing things illegal, you're going to have drama. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't like that in the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what the fuck happened. Like I said, it just came out of nowhere. Then when I realized later on it was federally subsidized, I was like, what? I was like, federally subsidized? I never knew Park Hill was mm -hmm. federally subsidized. No wonder why certain things took place in certain, on certain levels. Yeah, that explains why we have to pay attention to, you know, on the local, you know, it's, it, presidential politics is... is it's electoral college and it's blue and red, but on a That's local right. level, That's right. when you talk about city council, when you talk about who owns these buildings and all that, it yeah. makes sense to pay attention. Yeah, but as a kid, involved. you know, as kids and black kids, we don't yeah. really look into that. We don't do our homework. We yeah. just go out there and start wilding. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We, yeah. we ain't know nothing about that shit. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I remember my, my, um, my other my other people's fresh. He moved from Staten Island to, um, to the Bronx to, um, damn, what the fuck? I can't remember shit no more. Um, what part of the Bronx was that shit? Um, Castle Hill. He moved to Castle Hill, Hill. Yeah. Hill. These motherfuckers were so fucking tall. I was like, yo, man, these mm -hmm. fucking projects are stupid. Mm -hmm. It's like 30 fucking story high fucking goddamn project buildings. Mm -hmm. That and Coney Island. Yeah, like, Coney Island was wild. Coney Island was crazy. Other yeah. people moved to Coney Island. We went, to, we, went out, we went out to Coney Island to see these motherfuckers. Them niggas chase us up out the fucking jacks. I said TF together forever, Coney Island. <laughs> what? <laughs> I used to... Mermaid Boulevard oh, over there? Yeah. Them, them, them motherfuckers was crazy yeah. over there. Yeah. Them niggas crazy over there. Yeah, crazy. Right. On Mr. Excitement, we yes. skip around a little bit. Yes. You got these two tracks together, the dedication, which is the intro yes. into the song Drugs. Yes. And you and it's a story about these these fiends. I forgot, you know, I forgot about that. Yeah, you know, I have to do my homework, you know what I'm saying? But you're talking about how the dude was like, I don't I don't chase the drugs, I let the drugs chase me. You say, I don't love the drugs, but the drugs love me. That's what it was. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, this track, Drugs, and then it goes into the drugs track, it paints a vivid picture of that crack era. Why do you feel like it's important to document that on like a criminology street rap level? Well, I feel like a lot of people go through that, mm -hmm. that addiction shit. Mm -hmm. You know, that was one of the arguments in my, I had to take um, a Narcotics Anonymous class in fucking penitentiary. It's required for your parole. So when you go in front of parole, they feel like you fucking, you know, you, mm -hmm. you get rejuvenated, whatever you call that word. And um, one of the things they was always talking about is, um, um, admitting your addictions, mm -hmm. and um, we used to get in all, I used to get away into arguments with this fucking guy. This constantly, he's like, "Just because you sell drugs, you still a fiend." I was like, "No, I'm not, motherfucker." Well, you a he fiend? He thought he was Jay Z on the allure. Yeah, he he, he <laughs> I'm wanted, addicted to the life. Yeah, he wanted. He said, "No, you addicted to the money." Right. I said, "No, I'm not, motherfucker." And, you know, we used to always get into this. Said, "No, it's not the same thing." That motherfucker smoke crack. I sell him the crack. Don't mean I am a fucking fiend. You know what I'm saying? But, and we used to always get to these fucking arguments. Right. So, you know, time moved on, whatever, whatever, whatever. I won the fucking argument, though. Hmm. Because look at me now. I'm, you know, wow. I, don't, I don't do it no so more. I won in life. Yeah. Yeah. I won in life. That's what I said. It's, it, I, that's why I came with the terminology. I don't love the drugs, but the drugs love me. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's a lot, a lot of fiends feel that way. I don't like this shit. But it keeps calling me. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. I don't really love it, but it loves me, though. You know what I'm yeah. saying? That's like a, a push-off, uh, you know, a front, like, uh, just blame it on the drugs and say, fuck. Right, right, right. You know what I'm saying? Let's talk about Old Dirty Bastard. Oh, for my a little That bit. was my nigga. I'm sure he was. His presence is indelible. What he, what ODB means to the to hip-hop and to the world? Well, he, well, I'm gonna tell you something. If he was living right now, we would have we would be having way more fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Straight for that. I mean, yeah. It's more fun, and dudes' egos are being checked a little bit more. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because he had, he had that shit, man. 
we struggled with him forever. That's right. He was he was flown in with those vocals. Yeah, right? he had the he had he was going through a lot at the time with forever. It was hard to get a good verse out of him. He mm -hmm. was running around. He was you no, know, he was he was he was on his own dirty bastard shit. Right. Uncontrolled, you know, uncontrolled, uh, uncontrollable. I said controlled chaos, uncontrollable chaos. Right. And it's beautiful though to see y'all rally around the young dirty bastard. Yeah. And to see what he brings to the stage, he's not just doing a version of his pops, he's also bringing his own thing to the stage. Yeah, but I'm trying to tell you, he looks, he's just like his fucking father. It's like, uh, yes, his, it's like it's, his father's shit. It's out, uncanny. It's like his father's shit, shit out of turd with fucking hair on it. <laughs> and that's that nigga running around there. <laughs> like he had a baby and that, that shit, turd is running around on stage like this motherfucker doing the same. Yo, I'm telling you, I told him all the time, like, yo, dude, you, spook, you be spooking me out. Mm. And it has to do with a lot of I, I, the shit I believe about DNA. Also, mm -hmm. I feel like the same way with DNA. Like your baby's is gonna act like you without you even being there. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And it's like I never thought about that shit. And then I see him. And I look at my babies. I'm like, damn. And you know, my daughter's mother be like, your daughter act just fucking like you, but a female version. <laughs> I be like, what the fuck does that mean? Yeah. Then one day she just hit me. You know, because I asked. I said, you where's your boyfriend's at? Uh -huh. She was like, daddy. When I get a good enough one to bring you, that's when you're gonna see that nigga. Well, that's good. But that's some shit I would say that's what <laughs> fucked me up. <laughs> that's what fucked me up. You're doing it right. You're because, doing it right. Because I'm like, I sat me down, I had to sit down, say, you know, little girl, I, I, I gotta sit down with that question. You just rattled my fucking cage with that. It's crazy because, you know, personality and character. Mm -hmm. People's personality does not distinguish their fucking character. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Motherfucker come out and you like, oh, that's my man, that's my dude. Little do you know he's a fucking murderer, he's a liar. Mm -hmm. You find out his real character, he trying to sleep with your girl behind your back. I'm like, dude, you fucking turn into a douchebag in five seconds. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, but that was my fault. He I was didn't, already a douchebag. Yeah, but I didn't know because he was, he, you know, his, his personality hit his character. Right, right, right. You know right. what I'm saying? That's why I told motherfuckers, give me a little time, I'll peel back your onions and see if in the middle of it stink. <laughs> You talking about doing the knowledge. Yeah. Going and that's God body terminology. Yeah, There's knowledge. a lot of God body terminology to use in hip hop. I feel like the nation of God's earths are the, the most influential thing when it comes to spirituality and culture well, in hip hop. Oh, I try I try my best, man. You know, I don't quote math every day, even though mm -hmm. it's the wisdom of knowledge today and it's the all borns understanding. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But a lot of these kids don't want to hear the knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Some of them do. Mm -hmm. Don't get it twisted. Some of them some of them need the great minds around them and get that that, you know, I was just fortunate to be around a lot of great minds growing up. You know, mm -hmm. like like I said, it's another thing too. I told niggas all the time, what really attracted me to RZA is mm -hmm. his fucking mind. Right. You know what I'm saying? I love people with great minds. You know what I'm saying? You got a great mind, we can sit down and talk, we can build. You know what I'm saying? And I know you know what's right and what's wrong. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's the problem with a lot of motherfuckers. They run around here acting like they don't know what's right and what's wrong. You loosey goosey with it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? And then, but RZA, he always had a great mind. And I was like, wow, this nigga right here. He knew his degrees, the back and forth. He knew the whole 120. He knew the Bible. This motherfucker knew a lot of shit. I was like, I love this nigga. Who the fuck is this nigga? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like, this motherfucker's a genius. I'm a genius, so I'm gonna go fuck with this right. genius nigga. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, and then sure enough, you know, it just, we all, I tell Ghost all the time, it's like we all atoms. We just came together and put our hand on one atom at one time and, and formulated some type of nucleus that can't even explain how it fucking came together with this crazy shit. Cause all our mothers and fathers and different entities was mm -hmm. from different places and they all settled down in the same spot and who the fuck would have known? My favorite part of touring with the Boo and getting to know y'all a little better, cause I know all y'all before, but now we becoming more like brothers from yeah. being on tour. Yes, sir. And it's just to see, I'm happy to report to the fans that who you think the Wu-Tang is, is exactly who the fuck they are. <laughs> like, I was walking down the hallway the other day, and I seen Ghost in a fly tracksuit. Yeah. He had the do-rag, I mean, he had the, you know, the do-rag on and the hat, and everything was crispy, and the outfit was right, and he was in the workout room on a bike, and it dressed like Ghostface, though. I almost expected him to have the eagle on the arm. I'm like, yo, this nigga just work out dressed like Ghostface? because he was doing his cardio for He was doing his cardio. Like, it was beautiful to see. Yeah, man. I seen, um... You know, I've been on a flight. I, I do a lot of shows with Jizzard. I've seen him on a flight. I've never been on a flight with that man and not seen him play chess. He's playing chess on the flight. Yeah, he's playing on that fucking little, his little yeah. computer he bought. He's playing against the computer. That's right. When I walk into the room and I see you and Young Dirty Bastard and, and Rizzer in the room, y'all building 
in the same way I would expect to see RZA building with y'all. That's right. It's not fake. It's organic. It's exactly who oh, y'all are. We talk about some shit now. We, yeah. Oh, yeah, we do. We, it got deep. Yeah, we do. You know, I don't even want to talk about the stuff we was talking about, but, you know. It got deep. Dudes is talking about this Palestine and New Jerusalem, New, New, um, you know, Israel stuff. Mm -hmm. I tell them, don't ask me about that, bro, because I don't know what the hell these niggas fighting for. I know I'm fighting in these goddamn streets every day, so don't ask me about that. That's a good answer, because I think too many people speak on it without knowing. You know, one of the things about being, being, being God is knowing knowledge that's, yourself. That's right. Right? That's right. You got to know, listen, and observe. That's mm -hmm. knowledge. You know what I'm saying? You do the knowledge. You got to know something, listen. And observe in order to get the knowledge. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna speak on political issues mm -hmm. if I ain't got my feet on the floor. If I ain't out there with holding the ratchets, mm -hmm. going through the motions, and understanding the political situation these brothers is in, mm -hmm. both sides. So don't ask me shit about that. Well, the one thing I will add is that the Wu Tang has always shown solidarity with the PLO style and all that oh, in, the, in the lyrics. You know, we was we, we with the Warriors shit all day. Yeah, you know? and that's that's what I was gonna add is that if 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 for on the street level, if people are confused about any conflict, not just Palestine and Israel, yes. but any conflict in the world, when you have oppressor versus oppressed people, just look for the niggas. <laughs> Whoever the niggas is in the situation, that's who you should side with. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? That's that's yeah, basically. Yeah, niggas niggas cannot control nobody water. They can't stop nobody from going in and out. Nobody. They can't put. They can't put no restrictions on nobody. The we, ones who got the restrictions put on them, that's yes, the niggas. That's the motherfuckers. Yes. Those are the motherfuckers going through the bullshit. Word. Word. You know what I mean? That's it, man. Word. You know what I'm saying? They asked me. They asked me the same shit with Kanye. Remember when Kanye wild the fuck out? Mm -hmm. He was asking me about that shit. I'm like, dude, I don't want no. I don't want no political shit. Right. The fuck you at? I'm a. I'm a musician, dude. Right. I'm ex-con. Graduate slash author slash thinking. That's all I know. Mm -hmm. You put Trump in the studio with me, I'll beat his ass. <laughs> but you fucking you you put me in for some political shit. I'm like stumped because it's like I told you the papers mm -hmm. is like six feet tall. You ever seen the fucking bill? Them shits mm -hmm. is huge. Mm -hmm. I looked at that shit one day. I was like, nigga, don't, don't ask me about that shit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know nothing about no political shit. Black Lives Matter. I don't know nothing about that shit. <laughs> don't ask me. About nothing, how I feel, nothing. All I know, don't fuck up my babies and don't fuck up my goddamn money. That's right. it. You know, I'm on tour with y'all, and it's funny because one of the things we spoke about in that session when we was building is about how special it is that people ha can have different personalities, larger than life personalities, yes. and still come together and, and, and work together. Like you say in one of your records, I could talk about my fucking brothers. Yes. You can't talk about my fucking brothers. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And if I see you talking about my fucking brothers... Punching your goddamn face. That's right. Yeah, that's my family. Even though we're crazy hip-hop family. Mm -hmm. mm, some crazy motherfuckers I grew up with, bro. But, you know, dudes be acting like they get loose sometimes. I'm like, yo, dude, come on, man. Just mm -hmm. keep that shit over there. And um, I know one thing for sure. We ain't going back to the hood, man. We ain't, right we ain't never going back to the streets. And I don't that's know right. fucking niggas try to... To this day, niggas trying to send me I sell drugs. I'm like, nigga... I ain't seen a drug since I was like 19 years old. Oh, what are they doing? They said, I see, I heard about fentanyl. I was like, what the no? <laughs> I was like, what, what, the, the, what the fuck is that? Right. What is leaning niggas? Is they killing niggas with that shit? Mm -hmm. What it look like? I they went on that shit. Yeah, I went on online and saw the shit. I was like, that's what these. I said, you know what? I'm, I know I'm an old ass nigga. You know what? Hennessy and some weed. Mm, thank you. No doubt. I'm going to keep it right there. Now, to revisit Better Tomorrow again, because this is one of my favorite verses from you. You were open on that song about your son, Dante. Oh, Tay. Tay he shot. Yeah, Tay, he, Tay, Tay was going through his motions right now. He, uh, he in the studio. I no, he got, got some music. Yeah, out. I, I don't want him to be no motherfucking man. I hate that shit. I ain't going to front. I told him that shit all the time. The whole mm -hmm. world know. I, I love my son, love my babies, but I just didn't want him doing this music shit. You know what I'm saying? Both my kids do, do this music shit. Yeah. And so, you know, obviously... I was the same way, you know, when growing up, I, I, I purposefully would try to steer them away from it. Yes. Just because it's hard. And it's heartbreaking. Yes. Like you don't want to see your kids heart. Thank you. I, you know I, yes. And it's like, you can get money and be famous doing anything mm -hmm. nowadays, bro. I say, I say, I must be telling my little blood, I'm like, you little nigga. I'm like, yo, man, if you was the best rubber band salesman, nigga, you getting famous off selling rubber bands. Mm. You could be a hamburger of whiz. You could be the dude that sell the best hamburgers. Or got them, you know, or the or the best tire salesman. But yeah. the hardest part is when they become adults, you gotta let go and just let them do what they do. That's what I had to do. Yeah, I had to, I got to fall back. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I had to fall back. Both my kids is on my new album, um, and the only reason I let them get on my new album is because 
they might could rap better than me. No. They got on because they good at what they do. No, it's don't not get nepotism. twisted. No, nah, my little man's nice. Dante yeah. is nice. I heard some music. I yeah. checked it out. My little man is nice. You know what I'm saying? But, like I said, I'm biased because I'm your father, mm -hmm. and I always want the best for you. You know what I'm saying? He got a degree in, in film. Mm -hmm. Hire my boy for That's film. Dope. He got he know how to edit, he know how to splice, he know how to cut. So he's self sufficient. The, if he wants to, if he yeah. wanna do that, he's doing the music instead. I'm like, yo, dude, you just drop, you just spent the whole tuition. I think all those skills gonna uh, apply themselves at some point. Yeah, exactly. That's what yeah. I said. That's you know, that's what I had to give it to, you know, to the to the to the guard, man. I had to be like, you know what? Yeah. You take it over. He was like, yo, it's gonna apply somewhere down the line. I said, okay, I hope so. You know what I'm saying? What we do is attractive though. I mean, being an MC is a high level skill. It, it looks attractive. But it you is. see how much fucking hard work it's it is. It's hard. It's, lot, it's like dudes think this is, dudes think this fucking rap shit is the romantic cruise, right. love boat cruise or some shit. Yeah. Like, this, I mean, even with this podcast, we sat down. We already sat down to do this. Yes. And it was like, we can't do this. We got to go to work. Yeah. Just the other day we did this yeah. bullshit. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's like, motherfuckers think this shit is a, a like, you know, like what we, how we got here. Like, motherfuckers say we, you got lucky. Motherfucker lucky. Right. Mother, do you understand the amount of footwork we had to put in? Yeah. We had to do every radio station on the West Coast, mm -hmm. on the East Coast. That's when you had to actually Midwest. go to the radio yeah. station and yeah. shake the DJ hand. And remember when you had to, you from the same era, remember when you had to not just go to the radio station, but on top of you pouring your blood and sweat and tears out onto the track that you're trying to convince the DJ to play, you also got to fucking make a rap for the DJ with his name in it just to get him to play the rap you already fucking gave him. That was terrible, man. We, Drops. that was crazy. That was a crazy. We was getting taken advantage of, but we loved the hip hop so much that we went for it. We were like, oh, rapping. We love to rap, but when I think now that I'm approaching fifty, and I think about how many how many DJs I did verses for to try to convince, I'm like, yo, they they got me. I'm glad it happened. It was a lesson I need to learn, yeah, man. But it was a lot of grinding, bro. But they got it us. Lot, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, it's okay. But I told them it was a lot of work. They think you can come from the, from your Instagram and, and blow. Mm -hmm. I'm like, dude. It's not. Mm. That's not how you are gonna blow. You can't just blow from your Insta, from your gram. You don't get it twisted. You know some niggas do get a spark mm -hmm. here and there and there. But that's you know they dropping five. You dropping five hundred thousand albums a fucking month, but only five niggas is actually selling. Mm -hmm. Five hundred thousand fucking records come out every fucking month. Five or four <laughs> of these niggas is only the ones that's popping. Yeah. Think about that. You know what I'm saying? When you're trying to get on this rap shit, you know what I'm saying? Why not be a lawyer? Why not be a doctor? Why not be something that can, you know, you can generate two and three hundred thousand dollars a year being and a truck driver. And for fun. Yeah. And put your own album out. Yeah. yeah. If, if, you, if you got your job right, you want to get, get a job, you want to get some shit that's going to make you some money. But... And it's crazy because the record industry is over. Like, at this point, the only way you're really getting on is if you have somebody who already made some money doing something else who's behind you. That's it, bro. Which is why even with the drug game, where people coming from nothing was able to invest in music and flip into legal from that. Some people was. Some people, didn't, you know, not a lot of people didn't make it, man. Yeah. You know I mean? Let's talk about some of your solo work. Yes. Um, shout out to Scotty Waddy. Yes. Because you have, I think, made an effort to put him on. Jackpot. Yeah. Yeah, man. On, this, my, on the solo that's my, records. That's my dude. He was living in the next building. I would hear his name on Wu-Tang Records, but I would hear him rap on your records. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's, on my, he's on my new joints, too. I'm getting, him, I'm getting ready to get him. I'm trying to get his record done, but, you know, this shit is like... You know, I'm not home. You know, we've been going for like the last yeah, two yeah, years. Yeah. So, you know what I'm saying? So it's kind of fucked up. But Waddy, you know, he was like, uh, I ain't gonna front, he was like my little bodyguard growing up. Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Cause like I said, in the Avenue the Crew niggas used to tear us up, the little mm. fucking OGs. They used to take our money and give us wedgies and beat us up and shit like that. And <laughs> Waddy used to come up, leave that nigga alone. Him and him and Ross Sean and Bar Sean mm. and them. But he's also a dope rhymer. You know what I'm saying? Right. He was also. Yeah, he got some bars. Yeah, he was. He got, he got some, yeah, he crazy. I'm telling him right now, he got some bars. Right. Like, I ain't gonna front. He be rocking. Sometimes when I need a spark, I like, yo, nigga, I call Waddy, nigga, nigga, just fold my chairs up. I'm like, yo, dude, what the fuck you just say? He be saying some ill shit, man. I ain't gonna front. Mm. I'm trying to get at least about a good five, six cuts from the nigga and, you know, put him out there before, you know, he gets too right. old and shit like that. He don't even really give a fuck about blowing. He just want niggas to know that. He got the bars. He had bars at this moment, you know what I'm saying? Now, it's not just about the bars with your solo records, though, because, okay, the, one of the reasons I knew this tour was going to be dope, on, on top of it being De La and Nas and Wu-Tang, is in Nashville, when I came in the building, and I, I, you know, I still get nervous and jitters. I'm still a fan of y'all niggas. Yes. And these are big stages, and I'm still like, okay, I got to represent. Yes. And so I'm trying to work through 
my nervousness and get my superstar power on. And you came in with the speakers wrapped around you playing the soul classic jams. Yes. And that immediately put me at ease. Because I said, this is my family. This is what I would be listening to. That's I don't right. even have to set. I had a speaker. I don't even have to set up my speaker. Because you in the room next to me playing the jams. And then, you know, I see y'all arguing about, you know, um, Stephanie Mills versus Lou Rawls. You know what I'm saying? These are real arguments who take me having in the dressing room. You know what I'm saying? And then on your solo album, you come out singing. You start off singing Gloria Gaynor. That's how it starts. Then you get to soul dazzle. You know what I'm saying? And you 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 out there really, really, really crooning. Yeah, man. I, I, There's another one you have. We let them later songs. on. Um, get mine. Oh man, I forgot. You, Whatever you doing, a, some blues shit. That was some, yeah. That was a that was a blues track. Yeah, you doing a, some blues shit. On yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Um. On the second album, you sing in the Lamont Dozier joint, the, the Fish Ain't Biting joint, oh, but you flipped it. damn, I forgot about that. That was Hungry. Yeah, This Is Your Life, you got. Yeah. yeah, Hungry. Yeah. Tell me about your affinity for classic soul music and how that influences your art. Well, I love, I felt like that era of soul music was the greatest era of music. Mm -hmm. Like, the musicians and the instruments they was using and the singers was like phenomenal. Like, the fucking voices on these motherfuckers was incredible. Like, the singers, they don't make, like, Angela Winbushes no more. They don't make Anita Bakers. They don't mm -hmm. make the New Births and all these fucking groups that was out. You know what I mean? Like, the you know the main ingredient and all, mm -hmm. and all the Manhattans and the floaters. The Manhattans, that's the group that did the singing in the movie... Um the Five Heartbeats. That's right. It was the Manhattan's doing that real singing. Yeah, bro. Yeah. Those motherfuckers was, yo, they fucking, they, they had fucking pipes, man. Mm -hmm. Motherfuckers would really sing and they can really orchestrate and put together songs. You know what I'm saying? And it's like our era. Right. I'm like, what the fuck? Right. I can't get inspired by that shit. You know what I'm saying? But... Certain certain music I do get inspired. Like I like reggae music, and some of these little niggas do be saying some shit sometimes. I'm like, oh damn, that's a nice one, little mm -hmm. man. You know what I'm saying? I, I like when little dudes spark me. You know what I mean? I'm not one of those old artists who some oh, just fuck this new music, ooh, <laughs> boo. No, I'm not that type of dude. I'm like, ooh, little shorty got it. You getting right, it? Right, I'm the same way. You know what I mean? Like, damn, this little nigga right. getting it in. All right, there's still some blood out here. You know what I'm saying? Word. Yeah. Now Ghostface also be on that soul music. Oh, yeah. Holla, he just rhymed over the vocals. He want to rhyme over every soul track in right. the goddamn world. Right, he don't even world. take the vocals. Nah, he, he just, just rhyme over the goddamn vocals. That's how much he love that shit. Right. <laughs> I seen when I'm, one of my favorite Ghostface moments is shout out to Action Bronson, but when he got mad at Action Bronson, but when he was talking to him, he had a Teddy Pendergrass in the, in the back. On the new album, Liberation, I say, every gangster I know, they love soul music. You know what I'm saying? That's right. That's Absolutely. Because they know the good shit, man. It's like, the, it's like where I'm going to get my inspiration from. Right. Either from some new fly shit or the old classics. And that's where La Shea Shea La Ghost comes from, which you are a huge part of this record. That's right, that's right. You know, this is a record that, you know, Dr. Buzzard and the Savannah Band, I grew up listening to this record. I knew that record was imprinted on my DNA. So when you and Ghost came with that record, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that was a crazy... That's a funny story how that shit came about, too. Talk about it. Because, you know, he was like, um, the rough rider put my... Bust right through him. Mm -hmm. Ghost told me to say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, listen, I don't want to get He's too like, yo, graphic. Get, yo, yo, I don't want to get too graphic. Say, say that. Rough Riders was sold individually and in sync by singles in the hood at the bodegas. Yes. And and if you from where we from, you you couldn't afford the whole pack of the. Of nah, the you got to get a single. You, you had a go single. Get the one rough you had one doing. And that shit would bust right open. <laughs> yeah, man, yeah. <laughs> a lot but of babies but exist at the time, because but of Rough Riders. He was trying to get, he wanted me to get at the Rough Riders, though. He wanted me to get a damn oh, maximum dudes. Oh, I thought y'all was talking about the con. Nah, he was the one. He wanted, he, Double he wanted, entendre. He, yeah, he wanted me to start a little, you know, a little ink in the ink with these guys. <laughs> you know, but we wound up becoming, you know, good good family. You know, DMX, Jada Kids, The yeah. Locks, you know, Eve and all of them. You know, that's, that's all fam now, you know what I'm saying? All that, you know, you grow up and shit. Yeah. I mean, the Wu came out, particularly with Ghostface and them, and I don't know, going Ghostface and Raekwon was talking about don't, don't buy our shit, and we, 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 them, we them niggas, and on the, I think it's maybe the, um, the, the, I don't know if it's Pretty Tony or there's one of the albums, Ghostface album where, where the Stairway to Heaven intro. Okay, okay. Where Ghost is like, yo, you see how these niggas is doing the names and they doing the fly silk shirts and this, and and y'all niggas is fans, y'all fans of the shit, but y'all also paying attention to what everybody doing. And competing. Like, I always hear stories of Wu-Tang, like, we buying albums listening to what people doing. 
And they'd be like, nah, we, we, we better than them. We gonna compete with them. Dude, that was, this is a competitive sport. Yeah. Rap is a very competitive sport, man. It's mm -hmm. like, this is worse than basketball at this motherfucker right now. Yeah. You know, dudes is like, you know, trying to get in their tours and trying to get on their, you know, get on their, they one two stepper and mm -hmm. seeing what the next man doing and like, oh shit, I gotta do that. Nah, dude. They sometimes you just gotta be yourself and enhance what you got. You know what I'm saying? And just take what you got and just right. enhance that shit, B. Man, you know? I was today years old when I learned this. Shout out to Mike Ladd. He comes from the spoken word tradition. Oh, the dude did the hook. He's on the hook. Yes. The hook. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Damn. New classic is um. Is, is, no, that's not no new, new classic. classic is, that's large professor. That's large pro. Yeah. Um, I always I, want, I always wanted to beat from him. That's why I got him on this. Cause I always wanted to beat from him. I always wanted beats from Dre, Swiss, mm -hmm. uh, 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 Pharrell, mm -hmm. and um, who else I wanted? And DJ Quick. Mm -hmm. I want always wanted some music, some type of beats from these guys. I got some real good songs with Quick. That's Quick is the person. Quick is I a think. sneaky. He's a sneaky fucking badass motherfucker. He's like he's quiet but dangerous on the music. You know when what I'm saying? You, when you um, listen to DJ Quick's music, it's a lot of funky bass lines and sounds that you think come from the keyboard because a lot of that West Coast production is keyboard based. Yeah. But in the studio with Quick. All those little sounds, boo, and all that little shit that you be hearing in the production. He pulled out a bag of like African instruments. He in the booth just playing little, little instruments I never seen before. In his own. Yeah, it's organic. I thought it was a lot of computer music, but it wasn't. Yes, yeah, okay. Shout out to Eric D uh, Jesus Combs who plays bass with Quick. He's on my new album as well. You and Method Man used to be roommates. Me and Meth was Batman and fucking Robin. Yeah, y'all was very close. Yeah, we was we always we still close, yeah. you know. But you know, we met him, so we grew apart. You know how it is. He got a family. Mm -hmm. I didn't get married. He got married, so you know. But in your book, we still you, we still, you, we still related blood though. You bring up a lot about the story of of being in the trenches with him. Oh, he was in the trenches hard, man. You know what I'm saying? Hard, hard. Very inspirational stuff. Hard, because you know he got kicked out of his house, mm -hmm. and he was going through the motions. I saw him, and we was always working together. On a, a Staten Island, uh, the, the, the Statue, Statue of Liberty. Liberty yeah, issue, he's at right? the Statue of Liberty. And we yeah. was working together, and um, you know, we just some, we just clicked. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And he was like I said, but before that, I met him at 49. He always had an upbeat. See how, see how his energy is? Mm -hmm. He's always been like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? That ain't a front. That's how Meth always was. He was right. always upbeat. And me, like I said, I was a vibration dude. Mm -hmm. I was a vibe dude. Visit with the great mind. Ray, I mean, you know, Meth had the upbeat shit. Kappa was a fly nigga. Deck was quiet and sinister, like he always right now. And Ray was just Ray. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? He was just trying to get his hustle on. And, um, you know, that's just how it was. But Meth, you know, he was doing, you know, he got kicked out the crib. Mm -hmm. And he was staying, I think, at our Sean house. He was, he, was looking, he was looking down and out. Mm -hmm. And I snatched him up. I was getting money. I was, you know, doing my hustle one, too. I was like, come on, come on man. Just mm -hmm. get it in. Come on on the block. Just get it in. Man, we got we to survive. He was like, fuck it. He went, he went in foot face, man. Foot, I mean, on feet first, man. And he had to get his bones up. Yeah, he had to fight. He had to pull guns on niggas. He had to do all type of shit just to solidify his, his presence in that area of the, or the, U, or the U building. Cause you know, at the mm -hmm. time it was just a lot of niggas out there getting money. Mm -hmm. And if you was taking up a lot of the clientele, niggas just niggas was mad. Like, yo, dude, you eating up, you eating up all this shit. Nah, nigga, you gonna go on the side, we gotta get it in. <laughs> you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? It was one of them type of situations. But you know he held his own. You know what I'm saying? He held his own, and um, but he knew not to get too comfortable because after a certain amount of time, he ain't even had to do it no more. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He helps me hustle up enough bread where he's like, you know what? You ain't gotta do that no more. You just go down and get in the studio and get focused on your on your shit, and um, that's what happened. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know he's he was he was able to get focused, and I wasn't that focused. I was trying to just I was still trying just trying to hold it down out there mm -hmm. when they was just tearing each other up out there. You know what I'm saying? So that's about it, man. Well, I'm glad that you shared your story with us in that book because I, you know, I come from the, from, you know, having a bookstore and, and, and I wrote a book as well. Yes, sir. And so I appreciate when hip hop document, because if we don't tell our stories, who will? And, um, you know, I want to shout out your moms. Oh, my moms. Yes. Um, she's also, I loved hearing her voice on the wisdom from the Venom joint. Yes. Um, but you also, in the book, you, you didn't hold anything back. No, no, no. I told her I wasn't going to hold nothing back. But, you yeah. know, it was, we, she you know, she, how I came about. You know, she got um, she got raped, mm -hmm. and she had to make a choice whether she's gonna keep me or not. And she made a choice to keep me. Mm. She said she had some type of dream, whatever, whatever, and that you know that this this baby was gonna be a you know it's gonna be a good seed. 
So she said, fuck it. And she had me. And bippity boppity boo, here I am right now. Look at God. <laughs> and I, you know I, I, I imagine that even writing the book, I know that you said in the book that your mom didn't want you to share that, but I imagine that that could have been therapeutic for both of y'all. Yeah, well, you know, she don't want to share some th certain things. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we we had some gripes, you know, family shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is, man. Family is family, man. Those only motherfuckers can get up on you and bang you in your neck sometimes. Right. You know, the ones closer to you, the ones bang your neck. But um, other than that, you know, she, you know, she take it with a grain of salt, and it's her story. And then it's like, I'm proud of the situation. She might not be proud of it, but I am. My mother's era, them women didn't have no fucking money. They did it on their own. They did it by themselves. Whatever they, whatever they was going through, whatever was domestic violence and all that shit, they was handling that shit on their own. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? If a, if a nigga put a hands on my mother, my mother pulled a pistol out on a nigga. Like, yo, <laughs> touch me again, I'm gonna kill you, nigga. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's where my mother come from. She came from Brownsville. So it's like, you know, that's why I salute her in a sense. You know, she might have took it. I don't know how she took it, but she might have took it a certain way. But at the same time, I always big up like, yo, ma, you a strong woman, man. For real. Because I ain't never seen nobody drop off no groceries in this fucking house. Mm. And you got two kids. And one of your fucking kids became a star. And the other fucking kid is down in, you know, doing, he living too. You got great crayons. You got grandkids. You got mm -hmm. running around here. And it's like, you doing, you did good. You know what I'm saying? For a woman that came from where the fuck you came from and what happened to you. You know what I mean? You got a house, you got cars. Like, come on. I think yeah. it's definitely important for us to uplift the single mothers and what they do for us. That's right. And it's definitely important for us to uplift victims of abuse. Yes. Any type of abuse. So That's I appreciate right. you doing that. That's right. I'm trying to say, like, yo, whatever y'all women be going through out there, if it's funky, 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 you know, survival mode is a motherfucker. You can do it. You know what I'm saying? You can pull through whatever, whatever, man, and, and make your babies right if you just program them with the right mental attitude. You know what I'm saying? My mother used to kick my ass. Like I said, I can't say the word can't around my mother. Mm. What you say can't, boy? <laughs> she right. chase me around the house. You say can't, I'm gonna whip your ass. Right. Impossible is nothing. Yeah, can't. I can never say that word around my mother. You better not say that fucking word around me. I'll fuck you up. I'm like... <laughs> well, to, God bless you. You know what I'm saying? So that's just what it is, man. Well, I did have one more question. I wanted to ask you what's going on with you, but before I got to that, I, I appreciate your time. But... um. You know, every time we've been talking about doing this for a long time, and every time I mention it to you, you say, I'm gonna get you. No. So you, do you feel like you got me? Nah, you know. <laughs> what I mean is like I, sometimes I like, you know, I got like I study psychology, yes. right? When you program, you throw shit in the air, it it makes people get on their grind. It gets mm -hmm. makes them get tight. It tightens up, but sometimes it tightens them up in a good way. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. It makes them get on point and and and, and you know, straighten they shit out. That's you know? interesting. See, that's okay. That's psychology. Yeah, you use psychology. Psychology. yeah. I'm, 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 I'm weird. Okay, you know nah, that's, that makes you know, sense. I'm like Yoda. You might not know certain right. things, like certain things I be doing. That's it, why Mef said he's a psychotic figure. You know, you know, psycho. He call me a psychopathic thinker. Psychopathic thinker. So whatever. Yeah, he called me a psychopath. <laughs> but at the time, I, I, I admit I was psycho. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I was a recovering maniac because Mef saw me on the brink. Mm. Of sometimes having to hold back a lot of violence. Mm. And he was like, nah, don't do it. Cause you're gonna have to pay for that shit later on. We're gonna get on, we're gonna get the fuck up out of this shit. And I'm like, damn. It just, you know, like I got in a situation when one of these dudes put his hands on one of my peoples and broke a jaw with a bat. Mm. And it was a dude. She, he got mad because she knocked him out. Mm -hmm. Boom, she knocked him out. She slipped, she slept the nigga. Her name, you know, she, her name was Hope. And she was notorious for knocking niggas the fuck out. <laughs> and, and she knocked him. I like that one. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Hope was knocking niggas out. And right. she had another brother named, you know, Aaron, but I forgot his name, Aaron or whatever. He was like six foot one, and he was knocking niggas out. But Aaron was kind of a little soft. But Hope, she was a gangster. So she ran down to the nigga. The nigga ran down to her. She whipped the nigga ass. He comes back and hit in the mouth, broke a jaw with a bat. Mm. She calling me up, what you gonna do about this nigga? I'm compressed in the cabin like this. I'm holding the bangers. I'm like, damn. And I'm sitting there like, what the fuck I'm gonna do about this situation? She calling me all out my name, calling me pussy and all this shit. Mm. Compressing me, compressing the cabin and compressing it. I'm like, motherfucker. But I ain't had to do nothing. One of my other, one of my other homeboys. Ran down him and tore his ass up. So I was like, okay. That was what that was. But to this, you know, when I finally seen her, ran into her again, she was like, 
Now I understand why you never, you didn't pull and you ain't so bad. So you ran out into it later in life. Yeah. When everything started changing. Yeah, when we, we were all celebrities now. She's like, right. she said, now I understand you, Yui. Mm. She's like, pardon me. She's just like, yo, I'm so fucking sorry. That's a good I, story. I didn't know that y'all niggas was building this type of situation. It says, I said, see, that's why I couldn't get at certain things. That's why I couldn't do certain things mm. because of, I'll still have more cases to this fucking goddamn day. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, so that's what it was, man. So, you know, shout out to Hope. Shout out to Hope. Yeah, you know, I was trying to put him in my book too, but they, you know, they said it was too long. Mm. I mean, but I'm, you know, I'm going to try to squeeze that Part in. Part two, I mean, look, you can write an autobiography over and over again. Oh, no, I got some, I got some, yeah. I, there's stuff in there that I didn't put in there that I, you know, book, book it, it was, two. yeah. So I want you to have a great show tonight. Yes. I'm gonna be in the audience chair and I'm gonna be on stage before y'all. Yes. I'll see you at Triumph. You, you bust some niggas down, baby. Oh you know, man, I'm having a good time. Yeah, you having a good time? Yes, indeed. Tell I want us you, what I else want, I want you to understand something. Y'all solidified. Yeah, it's like, it's like, daylight, yeah. yeah, it's like, don't, don't I want y'all I want y'all motherfuckers to think that, oh, we're gonna do this and it's gonna be over. Nah, dude, y'all niggas is this worked. Yeah. So we're gonna be here. We're gonna do this. <laughs> yeah. We gonna be here, bruh. What else you got coming? Well, right now, that's why I was gonna look at my joint. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to drop a record mm -hmm. next year. I'm not gonna let artificial intelligence write none of my rhymes because I, I want my fucking publishing. I'm letting y'all niggas know that. You, you letting artificial intelligence write your shit, they're gonna take your publishing, they're gonna take your fucking money. Continue on writing your own shit, those who do. I got a new drop, no, new album dropping in the beginning of this year, maybe next, you know, in the middle, whatever, whatever. Podcast Raw coming back, you know what okay. I'm saying? Hopefully I can get you on there. We're gonna talk, you're gonna chop I'd it love up to. again. We're gonna chop it again. I'm gonna get you though. Yes, sir. That's how <laughs> I want you to. I want you to tighten me up, baby. Tighten me out. And uh, we got some action figures coming out. Christmas, okay. grab one up before, you know, it's a collectible before they're gone. And then shout out to my nigga Crawford and my man Tank, two of those niggas in the game. Y'all keep knocking them niggas the fuck out. <laughs> I won money on you, Crawford. <laughs> Bust they niggas' asses again and again and again. And my nigga Tank, for the light skin, Tank. sound the light skin niggas. That's right. Fuck them niggas up for light skin <laughs> niggas. UGOD. He Love said light-skinned like. niggas is back in style here on the People's Party. One chocolate and one light skin. That's how I grew up. Chocolate, light skin. Chocolate, light skin. Chocolate, chocolate, light skin. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Peace sir. Peace, my Peace, my Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.